I must thank you for your kind invitation, Captain. It has been too long, old friend. Uh, thank you, Navok. Oh, please, Captain. Let us not speak as strangers. Then as what, Tomalok? As friends. I have always respected you, Captain. I hope the feeling is mutual. Certainly I respect you, though I must admit it has always been the kind of cautious respect one holds for a potential adversary. Come now, Captain. Are we not all beyond that now? That remains to be seen, Navok. But I'm not so quick to forget the past as others. Of course. I'd expect nothing less from the archaeologist in you, Captain. But you know better than most that times change. Uh, certainly times change, but the past remains unchanged. You don't forgive me for our past encounters? Forgive? There's nothing to forgive, Tomalot. But I won't be forgetting what happened either. So, you see our past encounters for what they truly were. And what may that be? A game, my dear captain. You threaten my ship and crew, put billions of lives in jeopardy, and it was all a game? Oh, come now, captain. Don't be so naive. Were it not for our little games, billions would have died and you and I would be among them. So you'd have me believe that all you did was in the name of peace? Peace? No, Captain. But for the sake of Romulus, just as you did the same for the Federation. And because of that, peace prevailed for both our worlds. Then it appears you remember it more fondly than I. Oh, come now. Don't be so coy, Captain. A diplomat? A man of peace such as yourself? You miss the game, even more than I. How very perceptive, Tomalok. I have to say I'm surprised to see you so affected. We are different men, Captain. But even I can only tolerate so much needless death, such waste of talent. That is why I yearn for the old game. Well then, Tomalok, to the game. To the game, Picard. After seizing the planet Beta Z and trapping the Klingons in the Volterra pocket, the Dominion turned their eyes eastwards towards Federation territory in the Beta Quadrant. Having outflanked the Federation line through the Calandra sector, the Dominion was now poised to sweep through 10 Federation sectors, practically unopposed. With such a rare opportunity presenting itself, the founder authorized Liana and Masset to continue their advance instructing them to carve Federation territory in two and once again directly threaten Klingon territory, whilst capturing as many Federation worlds as possible. However, Maset and Liana were both keenly aware of the risks posed by such a bold advance. They would need a commander who was equally prudent as he was bold, someone who would neither hesitate nor be carried away in glory seeking. They would find all these traits in one man, Vorta Sayaren. Sayaren won. Having never once been killed, he had developed a unique personality and was eccentric even for a Vorta. He was equally keen to grow his legend as he was to preserve his life, and so he could be trusted to seize the moment without getting in too far over his head. Upon receiving his assignment, Sayaren departed with glee, remarking, Soon, a Benzite pledge stone will hang from my chain. Sayaren took direct command of Jem'Hadar fleet group A9 and A7, and upon reaching the front line, immediately ordered his fleets to advance as fast and as far as possible. On November 3rd, he led his two fleets, as well as the Cardassian 18th Order, around the Federation front lines 
completely bypassing the remnants of the 10th fleet at Machus. On the 15th of November, they reached the systems of Oceanius and Lemma. Seeing nothing but open space ahead of him, Zayarin pressed on, only stopping to deposit an initial landing force, leaving it to the Cardassians to mop up behind him, while he pressed on, taking the systems of Kitaria and Belana by the 27th of November. As a result of this bold push forward, the Federation 10th, 14th and 5th fleets were now threatened by yet another Dominion pincer movement. However, before he could turn northwards, Sayaran wanted to reach the center line of galactic latitude, which just so happened to be past the system of Benzar. Meanwhile, the Cardassian 21st Order, alongside a Jem'Hadar fleet, drove the 10th fleet out of Machus. Still shaken from their defeat at Beta Zed and aware of Sayaran's pincer movement, they fell back to Baradis, allowing the Dominion to secure their hold on Beta Zed. At the same time, Sayaran continued his advance, reaching the systems of Alban and Ramatis by the 6th of December, still completely unopposed, and now only a parsec from Benzar, which was now solely protected by the newly formed Federation 16th Fleet under Admiral Fulner. Having realised back in October that the Dominion would likely be headed his way, Fulner had quickly mustered a fleet together from what little he had available. Over the next few months he had accumulated an eclectic mix of newly built ships fresh from the shipyards, along with vessels sent back behind the lines for repairs and refit. As a result, by December of 2374, he had mustered a fleet totalling 101 ships, including the newly assigned Battlegroup Sovereign under Admiral Paris. Being extremely rare and valuable assets, Starfleet Command had made the decision early in the war to hold the Sovereign class ships back from the front lines, instead keeping them spare for special operations or the defence of a homeworld. With Benzar in jeopardy, the Sovereign along with her escorts arrived on November 20th. They would also be joined by the two newly minted aggressive reconnaissance wings composed of three Nova class scouts and three of the newly launched Interceptor class destroyers. Developed as a more tactically focused derivative of the costly Intrepid class, the Interceptor, measured in at 165 meters long, it is armed with 11 phaser arrays, two pulse phaser cannons, one quantum and one photon torpedo launcher, serving as a top of the line fast destroyer. It is able to keep pace with its intrepid cousin, whilst possessing enough firepower to obliterate any enemy attack ships, and being agile enough to evade most larger destroyers. It was an ideal scout and skirmish vessel for future Starfleet offensives, but before it could do that, it would be forced into a role for which it was never intended, planetary defense. Fulmer was well aware of this, and so placed the new unit into a reserve under Admiral Paris. Fulner would instead rely on the system's defense grid. As a Federation homeworld, Benzar was well protected by an extensive array of sensor grids and automated turrets, which were all upgraded to resist Jem'Hadar weapons. And while the orbital space dock facility was still under construction, the planet Benzar was ringed with various other stations and protected by a planetary shield along with surface emplacements. As far as Fulner was concerned, nothing Sayaran had would be able to break through. On Sayaran's part, he viewed Benzar as an intriguing puzzle, one which he would solve through unorthodox thinking. On the 22nd of December, Sayaran commenced his attack with the Light Division of the Cardassian 18th Order attacking the northern edge of the system, while a Jem'Hadar battlegroup from the neighbouring fleet A9 did the same from the south. Believing that the Dominion were attempting to perform a pincer movement, Fulner ordered his light battle group to engage the Cardassian light division and repel them, while his second battle group would stand by to repel the Jem'Hadar but await reinforcements. Having disrupted the enemy fleet to his satisfaction, Sayaran initiated phase two, and a squadron of Jem'Hadar flew headlong at warp speed into Benzar's sun, 
carrying with them an isolytic charge. While Sayarin had been specifically ordered not to use such weapons until provoked, he reasoned that what the Founders didn't know wouldn't hurt them. And so, when the three fighters impacted the sun, the resultant solar discharge was channeled into a subspace rift. While it did not cause any direct damage, the radiation cascade in subspace rendered all subspace communications useless. Not only did this prevent Fulner from communicating with his fleet, but it also prevented the communications of the automated defense systems, meaning that they were unable to coordinate and concentrate fire. And so, as Sayaran entered the system with his main force of over 160 ships, he was able to simply charge through the defense grid. While his communications were also disabled, everyone already knew their tasks and objectives. The Jem'Hadar fighters drew the fire of the turrets, while the battle cruisers followed behind, knocking them out one by one as if they were mere target drones. Yet the Jem'Hadar would soon face the challenge they so wished for, as Fulner and his two battle groups deployed above Benzar. Surprised by the steadfastness of Fulner, Sayaran ordered a probing attack against the line, which came under coordinated attack from both ships and planetary defences. Sayaran soon realised that they had been able to communicate thanks to some form of antiquated radio, and so using radio himself, he ordered all ships to begin broadcasting on all frequencies. He then played an old Earth song which he had found by the composer Offenbach. With Federation communications completely jammed, Sayaran attacked in full force. Unable to coordinate, Volner ordered his ships to turn tail using his formation light to order a retreat. His ships, including those cut off on the flanks, followed his lead as they withdrew to the regular system, believing that the planetary defences would be able to hold off the Dominion while they regrouped. But Fulner had underestimated the abilities of the Dominion. Following behind the main force was a Cardassian siege division, with assault and artillery ships, as well as a Jem'Hadar battleship. At 1452, they commenced their bombardment of the shield, firing a rolling volley, never giving the shield a chance to recharge. And at 1505, one area of the shield collapsed, creating a gap for the Dominion and Cardassian landing craft. With 80 Regnars and 60 Jem'Hadar gunships carrying 2,400 Cardassians and 480 Jem'Hadar assault troops to the planet's surface. By 1540, these troops seized control of one of the planetary control nodes and were able to lower the shield over the southeastern hemisphere as well as the transport inhibitors, allowing the full invasion force to beam down, securing much of the southern continent over the next 12 hours, while the ships in orbit continued to cut holes in the planetary shield through which more and more troops would enter and repeat the process. By 0922 on the 24th, the Dominion had secured all key objectives on the planet's surface, including the shield generator, the defense grid, and the transporter control network, the remaining Federation forces fleeing to remote holdouts. At noon, a victorious Sayaran entered the capital and when offered the keystone by the governor, he casually added it to his trophy belt. While Sayaran spent the rest of his day basking in the glory of his victory, Maset and Liana grew nervous. The loss of Benzar was a grievous humiliation for the Federation, one which President Rosarev intended to avenge. In a meeting with the Starfleet Chiefs of Staff, he expressed his desire for Benzar to be liberated first and foremost. This led to the invasion of Chintoka being delayed by two weeks. However, as far as Starfleet Command was concerned, there was a problem with the President's directive. Of the five fleets near Benzar, only two were Federation, with the others being two freshly raised Klingon fleets and the Romulan Black Legion. Retaking Benzar would require the support of these forces and at present there was no clearly delineated command structure and also several political issues which made cooperation between the three powers difficult. 
the Klingons and Romulans were mutually distrustful, and many Starfleet officers, particularly those from the Southern Beta Quadrant, could still remember the brief Klingon war of just one year before. In order to ease tensions, Starfleet Command reassigned the headstrong Admiral Paris and put in his place the Enterprise Wing under Captain Jean-Luc Picard. An accomplished diplomat, Picard had ample experience of the Klingons and the Romulans. If anyone could bind these three fleets together, it was him. And as luck would have it, one of the senior commanders in the Romulan fleet was Navark Tomalok, an old familiar adversary of Picard, while the Klingon Ice Daggers were under the command of the newly promoted General Katamok. From the 28th of December to the 4th of January, Picard presided over meetings between Katamok, Tomalok, and Fulner. Eventually, a consensus would be reached. Fulner would be overall sector commander, defining objectives for the joint force, while the Romulans would be leading the battle, formulating the tactics and strategies to be used, with Tomalok serving as their main liaison officer. As is the mark with all great compromises, all were dissatisfied with this arrangement. Nonetheless, they forged ahead in their planning to liberate Benzar. It was concluded very early that the key to liberating Benzar would be to isolate it, specifically from the fleets on the flanks at Xanthras and Titus. The Dominion would expect a direct attack on Benzar, and so was relying on the two flanking fleets to reinforce should a massed attack happen. Fulner concluded that if they could fix those two flanking fleets in place, or even drive them back, Benzar would be open for the taking. However, the specific planning of the operation was left up to the Romulans, believing that they could secure the element of surprise, since their fleet had been cloaked in deep space. Tomalok decided that the Klingon and Federation fleets should engage the Dominion flanks, allowing the Romulans to swoop in and drive the Dominion from Benzar. Suffice it to say, Fulner was none too pleased with this arrangement, and he pointed out to Tomalok that the Dominion would have control of the system's defence grid, which could only be disabled via Starfleet command codes. Tomalok acknowledged this complication, and so flatly asked Fulner for the codes. Fulner, to say the least, was reluctant to turn over such sensitive information to the Romulans. Only after being persuaded by Picard, who pointed out that they had no other option, did Fulner finally relent. And so, the attack, codenamed Operation Raptor's Dawn, began on the 9th of January, 2375. As Fulner and the 16th Fleet, along with the Ice Daggers, launched an attack on the Jem'Hadar at Titus, whilst the Federation 11th Fleet and the Klingon Flaming Hearts attacked the 18th Order at Xanthras. Outnumbered by a factor of 2 to 1, Sayara knew that his flanks could not hold, and so he dispatched two divisions to reinforce his flanks, leaving only 80 ships to protect Benzar. However, he was confident that the system's defence grid would compensate for this, and he eagerly awaited the attack that he knew would come, waiting to spring his trap. But the attack would not come in the form he expected. At 1521, 16 Romulan warbirds of the Black Legion decloaked simultaneously, attacking Sayaran's overstretched divisions. Not knowing about the Romulan presence, Sayaran had neglected to form any kind of anti-cloaking perimeter, and so now the Romulan Quartaris freely rampaged through the system, destroying anything in their path. Sayaran ordered his ships back to Benzar, drawing the Romulans into the defense grid. He then activated the automated defenses, eagerly watching to see the Romulan behemoths be carved apart. Yet, he would be sorely disappointed, when instead the defense grid shut down. Sayaran frantically tried to get it working as the Romulan warbirds now closed in. Recalling his orders, in particular his instructions regarding the Jem'Hadar battleship, Sayaran knew that he had to fall back. Placing his battleship at the head of the formation, he led an orderly retreat from the system, easily sweeping aside the Romulan raptors, which tried to harry them. Meanwhile, the Dominion fared little better on the flanks, 
While the 18th Order was able to form a defensive line, they were ill prepared to receive a mass charge from the Federation and Klingon fleets, which broke through their lines and inflicted heavy casualties on their artillery and battle division, forcing them back. At the same time, the Jem'Hadar fleet was greeted by a similar sight. Engaging in open order battle, they hoped to stretch the enemy numbers and defeat them in detail, but were instead engaged by mixed Klingon Federation battle groups. Not only did they outnumber the Jem'Hadar, but their close cooperation prevented the Jem'Hadar from gaining any initiative. They could neither outmaneuver nor outgun the enemy fleet, and so after receiving Sayaran's retreat order, they too fell back with heavy losses. Yet while the skies of Benzar were clear of Dominion ships, the planet's surface was still swarming with Jem'Hadar, and the Romulans wasted no time and immediately began landing ground troops with 168 Kestrel gunships delivering 3,300 legionaries in just the first wave. Upon realizing that they were defenseless and abandoned, half of the 30,000 strong Cardassian garrison surrendered immediately to the Romulan landing force. Inside of three hours, the Romulans landed nearly 10,000 troops who immediately set about relieving the Federation holdouts. From the 10th to the 17th of February, a fierce ground war was waged between the Dominion garrison and the Romulan legions, along with an increasing number of Starfleet Marines and local militia. But without orbital superiority or the protection of a planetary shield, the Dominion was fighting a losing battle, cowering under localized shields and dampening fields. The Dominion troops retained control of five major cities across the globe, including the capital, Andros, with orbital bombardment being out of the question for fear of civilian casualties, the Allies were forced to retake the cities, street by street, only finally taking Andros on the 5th of February, after 21 days of constant fighting with over 3,000 Romulan casualties and 43,000 Federation casualties. But by that time, the battle in space had long since moved on. After taking Benzar, the Allies realized that the Dominion was overstretched and outnumbered. The Klingons, Federation and Romulans all agreed to continue their offensive, following the same pattern of massed attacks against the Dominion fleets. While Sayaran's frontline was supported in depth by the Cardassian 3rd and 22nd Orders, because his salient had been surrounded, the enemy fleets on the flanks would be able to interdict any attempts to reinforce the front. And so when they launched another simultaneous attack on February 12th, the Dominion were unable to reinforce their front lines as the Jem'Hadar at Ramatis were set upon by the 16th Fleet and the Klingon Daughters of Death, while the 18th Order at Alban came under attack from the 20th Fleet and Tomalok's Black Legion. Still shaken by their initial setbacks, both fleets were driven back with the Cardassians breaking almost as soon as they saw the Romulan warbirds decloak. While Sayaran initially stood firm under the fresh Klingon onslaught, as his battleship began to soak up more and more damage from repeated hit and run attacks, he too was forced back, but once again he left behind a garrison of Jem'Hadar on Ramatis III. This time, the Daughters of Death would spearhead the landings. After breaking the shield in one quadrant, 60 Klingon assault shuttles, along with 12 birds of prey, descended from the sky, delivering 1,560 of the fanatical warrior women to the planet's surface. With overwhelming speed and ferocity, they cleared the landing zone, and by the second day, over 4,500 Daughters of Death, along with 6,000 Starfleet Marines had landed and began assaulting the planet's key objectives. The 32,000 Jem'Hadar was spread too thin to hold the Allies back and so retreated to the antimatter refinery in the southeastern quadrant. High off their initial successes and keen for a swift victory, the Allied ground forces, which had since swelled to 40,000 strong, began to converge on the refinery from all sides and began closing in on the Jem'Hadar defenders. But at 0432, on the 16th of February, the unthinkable happened. The remaining Jem'Hadar deactivated the antimatter storage pods, causing a massive containment breach. 
the resulting inferno destroyed not just the facility, but engulfed half the continent. The planet was only saved by use of the planetary shields in conjunction with a quantum torpedo, which managed to collapse the reaction before it could grow any larger. While those troops who had been positioned further away managed to use their emergency transports to escape the blast, over 3,000 Klingon warriors and 10,000 Federation troops, as well as 4 million civilians, had been killed in this callous exercise in scorched earth tactics. This act was completely unprecedented in a war which had hitherto been fought in accordance with the Articles of Interstellar War. It is unclear whether Sayaran issued these orders under his own initiative, or if he was acting under the orders of the Founder. Regardless, it shocked not only the Allied powers, but also the Dominion's Cardassian allies, who became concerned that if Allied troops began advancing onto their soil, the Dominion may enact a similar policy. Regardless of who gave the order, it allowed Sayaran what he needed most, breathing room. While overall these casualties were not that significant, it did deprive the Allied frontline fleets of many of their embarked assault troops, meaning that they would have to slow down to be resupplied with fresh troops before they could advance again. This allowed Sayaran to make an orderly tactical withdrawal during March of 2375, falling back to the systems of Oceanius and Lemma, taking with him all the antimatter, deuterium and dilithium held on the planetary reserves of Belana and Kitaria, further slowing his pursuers. And by April of 2375, Sayaran had successfully retreated to his new defensive line, ready to join in the defense of the Dominion's greatest prize yet, the planet of Beta Z. And while the Allies knew that a great task lay ahead of them, they would go forward with newfound confidence in themselves and trust in their allies. Good evening, Captain. Good evening, Nabok. Ah, you're too generous, Captain. I'm given to understand this is from your family vineyard on Earth. Yes, it is. This particular vintage was made by my late father. I'm honored, Captain. I must say, it's the first time I've been aboard a Romulan warbird. It is, to say the least, quite an impressive ship. I presume it even exceeds your old Enterprise in size and scale. Most certainly, I must admit. In fact, I am almost reminded of the Enterprise D. How so? I always expected the interior of Romulan ships to be rather Spartan. <laughs> We are not Klingons here, Picard. We care just as much as you for the finer things in life. This ship has already spent four months in deep space and could potentially do so for 40 more. With 4,000 Romulans on board, this ship is our home, as I am sure your enterprise is for you. Indeed. Well then, to home. To home. Yet, I sense, Captain, you are not entirely comfortable there. How very perceptive, Tomalok. A man of peace, commanding a symbol of Federation peace and harmony. And now, that name is carried by a bird of war. And that man of peace must now command it. Indeed, times change, Tomalok. And we must change with them. Indeed. And where the future goes, only the fates can know.